So, Nia and I want to thank everyone who braved the traffic and poor parking and the Trump rallies and everything to come and listen to our slideshow tonight. We are telling the story of our 27-year journey photographing wildflowers on our public lands uh, across the West and uh, how it led to the publication with the California Native Plant Society of Beauty and the Beast, California Wildflowers and Climate Change. I want to um, just step in here for a moment and mention, um, Sue mentioned that we had seven awards. We've actually gotten, received seven medals uh, for the book itself and um, the Ansel Adams Award for Conservation Photography came from the Sierra Club and we just got that uh, earlier this month. And um, we will take you on a journey on how we created Beauty and the Beast, California Wildflowers, and Climate Change. So it all started in 1992 when there was this amazing uh, bloom of California wildflowers and bird's eye gilia in the Antelope Valley California Poppy Reserve in the eastern, in the western Mojave Desert. I had been um, at a lab talking with a friend of mine who was a nature photographer and she said, wow, you know, the Antelope Valley is really going off this year. It's, it's the first year in, in six years where they've had a decent bloom. You know, I'm, I imagine you've been down there a bunch of times and photographed that. And I said, no, I've never been down there. She said, really, you're a nature photographer and, and you haven't been to the poppy reserve in a good year? I said, no, no. She said, well, you have to go down there. So three of us went down. I left Nita at home because she was uh, between jobs but couldn't come down with me for a few days. So I went down and I saw this beautiful landscape. I'd never seen anything like this before. It was a windy day and the flowers were moving, you know, gently like waves. Uh, and it was just so incredible. It's something I'd, I'd, I'd never seen before. So I called Nita that night and I said, you have to see this. You have to come down. I don't know how long this is going to last. You know, it's the, uh, it's the desert with drying winds and if, if these things could be gone in a week or so. So you have to come down. So Nita came down, she joined me. And for a few days we photographed beautiful poppies in the uh, Antelope Valley. Rob and I met in a photo lab. Um, let's see, 30, we just celebrated our 34th anniversary and um, six couples counselors later, we're still together. And when we first met, Rob's focus was nature photography and my focus was people. I was a people photographer, and this was a photo from the Children of the Tenderloin Project that I had done. So I was on assignment when Rob first went down to uh, Antelope Valley without me. And many years later, we uh, got grayer and we joined forces and focused on wildflowers together. And we'll give you a little more story about that later. Uh as Nita said when she met me, this was about 34 years ago. This is the oldest image in the book and it was taken uh, just a couple of years before I met Nita. So this was taken probably 1984. At that time I was just looking for some beautiful pictures of trees at sunset. I happened upon this and wow there are these pretty purple flowers in there. So I well I'll put that in there too. It's an interesting photograph. So this is the oldest picture in the book. As I said, um, I had been photographing for about 25 years. You know, I, I wanted to do something more with my work than just take pretty pictures. So I was fortunate to contact someone at the Trust for Public Land. They hired me to do 30 images, I mean 30 projects on uh, privately held lands throughout the West and, and um, this is one of the images I made of on a project for them. This was privately held ranch land in the Sierra foothills that the, that the uh, Trust for Public Land eventually conveyed into the national park system. It became part of Sequoia National Park. 
and I had been doing uh, environmental issues like uh, mining on public lands, uh, forestry issues, and you know things like that. Uh, all all uh, documenting well, all the negative things that were happening on our public lands, and I was getting burned out because you know going to all these places and seeing all this destruction was really heart rendering. So I wanted to do something with positive images in a positive way that would still help uh, people get inspired to act with regard to either conservation or climate change issues. So I'm going to back up a moment and tell you a little bit about uh, my work. The image on the left was taken while I was actually a firefighter. I was stationed up in Leggett and working for the California Department of Forestry, now CAL FIRE. And um, I kept a camera on my belt and this was a pile of uh, truck tires that caught fire and that's why the smoke was so, uh, so black. And then I came to, Calif to um, San Francisco, came back to San Francisco and started working on a project called the Children of the Tenderloin. And that really launched the work I did on children and creating healthy communities. And through that project, the Children's Defense Fund found me and I ended up working with a, another artist, Taya Schrack, who did the hand coloring for a whole series of calendars that I did for them over the years. And then in Marin County, I started the Faces of Marin City when we moved to Marin City and did a whole series of um, banner projects that celebrated the diversity in different communities. And then I had some health issues, so I had to stop doing the people photography. And fortunately for me, it actually allowed me time to get outdoors with Rob and my degree in college was in biology. So this was actually bringing me back to my original studies. And Rob and I started to spend a lot more time out photographing wildflowers out in the field. And this is uh, Lake Winnemucca out by Carson Pass, which is one of our favorite areas for wildflowers. I was carrying 65 pounds of equipment and camping gear. Rob was carrying 85 pounds. He normally would carry 65 um, and I said I was never going to do that again. That was just too much weight. <laughs> but it got it, us into some beautiful places and in order to pay for this project we uh, found work providing images for healthcare, and this is one of seven um, lobby dividers that used our images in uh, the Kaiser Redwood City Medical Center. And we had 34 images built into this, um, into this hospital. So whenever we could, we used images of native plants. Um, uh, we promoted them. We wanted people to know that there were beautiful native plants to be found in the Bay Area. So we were lucky to sneak a few of them in in some places. And this is flocks that were photographed in, um, or Linnaeus, that were photographed in uh, uh, Bull Point at Point Reyes. And when there weren't very many flowers around, we actually find flowers every month of the year, if we look carefully. Um, one of the things we would do for the healthcare art was to go to uh, wildlife reserves. And this is Merced National Wildlife Reserve. which was just so wonderful because you not only have the visuals, but you also have the sound. And this is uh, Woodbridge uh, Reserve over by Sacramento. So people often ask us, uh, I'm, I'll address some of the most frequent questions that people ask. And uh, one of them is, what was your most beautiful experience? What was the thing you'll what was the experience you'll remember for the rest of your life? Well, in 2003, above the town of Gorman, which is on Interstate 5 as it goes over the grapevine 
from LA to the Central Valley, there was just this incredible bloom. I mean, I've been traveling that road for over 50 years, and I'd never seen anything like this in the springtime. There were, uh, let's see, there were flowers uh, um, from the freeway up to the top of the ridge that was about a thousand feet high, and then there were flowers about a mile wide. So about a thousand feet high and a mile wide was just covered with flowers. I said, I'd never seen anything like this before. The hardest thing was to settle on one, or you know, to, to find a composition because everything was just beautiful. So the uh, land in the foreground is Hungry Valley Recreation Area land. It's, uh, it's, it's state land. The freeway goes through the valley in the bottom. And like I said, from the bottom of the valley to the top of the ridge was all flowers and that was a thousand feet high. And one of the things that was wonderful is that we could get across and look back across at what is now private land, but we hope at some point will be protected. And this image, um, Rob received an award from the BBC and the British Museum of Natural History. They have a wild, wildlife photographer of the year competition. And this won an award in the category of uh, landscapes. So we got to go to London and to the museum, which was really fun. And then the exhibit traveled around the world. So we actually had um, some snowflakes while we were there. You might tell them about this. Yeah, the other, uh, the second most beautiful display of flowers we've seen is uh, in Carrizo Plain National Monument. Uh, and if people don't know that, it's kind of midway between Bakersfield and San Luis Obispo going east east to west. It's a national monument. It doesn't have the protected status like a national park does or a, or a national seashore does. Um, this, this, this year was an abundant year of, of flowers and uh, what, one of my favorite all-time landscape uh, photographs with wildflowers is this of the desert candles. Uh, this is in the Caliente range, which is on the west side of the Carrizo National, uh, of Carrizo Plain National Monument. So Bakersfield would be right over the hill, maybe about 20 miles away. It was over, Bakersfield is on the other side of the Tembler Mountains, which was on the east side. So this is the Carrizo Plain, and I, I did this to give people a sense of scale. I mean, how, you know, <clears throat> how expansive this particular bloom was. And I wanted to mention something about super blooms. When we started this project, our first super bloom, which at the time was called the 100-year bloom, was in 1998. Seven years later in 2005, there was a second 100-year bloom in the uh, Anza Borrego, Death Valley area. And super blooms kept continuing to the point where we realized that with climate change and having the large number of uh, the, the swings of the droughts and the deluge, we were having more and more hundred year blooms to the point where they started calling them super blooms. So we've, uh, th this is a detail of what you saw of that expanse of beautiful flowers. And we've, over the years, since 1992, we've used uh, 10 different cameras, including an iPhone camera. This is an iPhone image that Nita took at the Carrizo Plain. So people want to know, well, how do you do what you do? We, because our photographs of the uh, floral portraits look like they were done in the studio. Everything, every flower we photograph uh, is done in the, in the field with natural light, with the flowers safe and sound in the ground. So there are essentially three types of uh, floral portraits we do. The one at the upper left, uh, of the sneezeweed is typical of putting a black or white background behind the flower. We use backgrounds behind the flower to isolate the flower because almost always 
if you don't use it, there's this distracting out of focus background. We wanted to show just the beauty of the flower in the most beautiful light. And we call this a botanical portrait. And this is a two page spread from our book. And also in our traveling exhibit, there is what we call the behind the scenes section, which is something that's been very popular with people. So in the middle photographs on both the left page and the right page, uh, there's a technique I use and it's called the wrap series. I got tired of doing everything with, with just an absolute black background or an absolute white background with no texture. So I found a way to wrap the flower after experimenting with about uh, seven different types of, types of fabric, I found a way to wrap the flower in some beautiful fabric folds that I uh, thought complemented the overall composition of, of the uh, flower portrait. So the third way I photograph is something that I've de developed also that I don't know other photographers have done. I found a way to get the camera, the lens in contact with the petals uh, of the flower gently. So the camera lens itself is blocking the light that would be falling on the flower. So the light source is the transmitted light from the background. The background is the source of light. So that light is being transmitted through the flower petals. So it gives us this very, very soft, kind of abstract uh, uh, feeling to the uh, floral portrait. And that technique was what was used in the, in the two um, lobby dividers that we showed you earlier. So in the upper right uh, section of the page, you can see how we set things up. We have- We're gonna uh, have a bigger version of that. Yeah, we, uh, we bounce in light uh, where it's needed this, Flower of the Desert Lily took me two and a half hours to do after doing six Polaroids back then when I was using film. Uh, converted to digital photography in 2006 and, it, and it, it immediately gave me what I was seeing and it made flower portraiture so much easier and so much quicker. And the pile of clothes and, and equipment on the left is not there by accident that is helping to block the sunlight um, off, and keep it off the sand and the leaves so that it wasn't distracting to the flowers. And we had actually found, I had seen these flowers the night before, but it was getting too dark. So we came back early in the morning to photograph them. So the purpose is always to show the flower in the most beautiful light. Sometimes we'll use direct sunlight. Sometimes we'll use diffuse light and uh, sometimes we'll use a combination of both with just a little bit of sunlight on the flower. So this is, this shows some of the uh, setups that we use and, and how we get the image. And some well-known places. We live in Marin County, Southern Marin, which has an amazing amount of uh, diversity in the ecosystems and the plants. And so there are quite a few images in the book. Uh, excuse me, quite a few images in the book from Marin County. <clears throat> so we'll show you some of this is what we call setup photos and then the after photo. So you get a sense of uh, what went into what the environment was where these were taken. If we can't get into a spot without doing damage, we won't photograph. So often we're near the edge of a trail, the edge of a road. And often we find bugs that we didn't realize were there. So we have to deal with wind as well. And so there are different ways of trying to block the wind and depending on how strong it is. Marin Headlands especially quite windy. And sometimes it means almost a face plant on the ground to get at the eye, you know, to get eye level with the, uh, with the beautiful flowers. So Nina had found this image um, 
the previous day. Uh, we didn't have time to photograph it. We were coming back down the trail in kind of low light. I went the next day. Uh, it was a March day where we were still having storms go through. It was a cloudy day. I didn't know how much time I'd have to photograph this, but I wanted to get it before the uh, petals on the flower wilted. So I got a few pictures and got this all packed up and about two minutes later it started raining. So, um, you know, we're photographing in all kinds of light in all sorts of conditions, whether it's heat in the desert or, you know, or rain in places. It's just a treat to be able to be there under different conditions where the flowers live. And that's why it's so important to do things out in the field and not go into botanical gardens and take photographs of the species there. And we, we, we identify these photographs of, as his, hers, and ours. Most of them are ours. We work on them together. We collaborate. On occasion, they, uh, we will work on it by ourselves. In this case, I found the flower because that's something that I'm really good at. But I was in traffic school, so I couldn't go back and help Rob photograph it. So he was on his own. And so often we'll try to photograph the flower in a very different way than, you know, showing the whole flower, but still trying to give a sense of the essence of the feeling of the flower. And we're trying to not just document the flowers, but create art as well. So we, we look for different ways to capture it. And one of our favorites is the um, Western Azalea, and this is on the way to West Point and up on uh, Mount Tamalpais, um, partially because not only is it beautiful, but it smells like perfume. It's just beautiful, a really strong, wonderful scent. This was up in the Quincy area. We had driven all the way up to Quincy in order to photograph, and we'll show you a little later, the uh, mountain lady slipper, which um, someone called us or emailed us and told us it was, he could show us where it was. So we immediately drove up there. And this we found the next day, the Shasta iris. So this is how we photograph. Uh, when I talk about diff diffuse light, we have a big diffusion disk di disc that, that softens the light uh, falling on the flower. And uh, I use this very, very often because uh, frequently direct sunlight on the, on the flower might be too harsh or too strong. And this illustrates how we stay near a road or a trail to do, to do very little damage. And this was again a wrap from the wrap series, but an earlier fabric that was thicker before Rob found the, the lighter chiffon. The problem with the chiffon is you have any type of breeze and um, it'll ruin the folds. And so that's why there is so many rocks holding down this uh, fabric. We were at the, at the top of Morgan Pass in the Eastern Sierra about, uh, about 11,000 feet. And again, the background was just a uh, collection of, of rocks that didn't complement the uh, uh, portrait of the flower. So I thought, well, this is a good time to wrap it. And this was taken on the way back from Morgan Pass. So we're always trying to find ways to do something different. And Rob is a Capricorn, so I'm very good at finding the flowers and he's willing to have the patience to suffer on his knees for long periods of time. An average photograph is about 45 minutes. Often I'll do a, I'll do a composition, you know, spend a bunch of time setting it up and, and then I'll, I, I think I've, I've got it and I'll show it to Nita and she'll say, well, why don't you do it this way and look, you know, look at it at a different angle. So I do, and son of a gun, hers is better. So when we say his, hers, and ours, there's a lot of collaboration in the, in the process. I'm, I'm the one that's, that spends most, you know, most time on the ground 
<laughs> setting up the tripod and Nita's happy that I do. On that, then on the other side, she spends a lot of time holding reflectors, staying still and, and things like that. So it's something that couldn't be done easily without the two of us most of the time. And this is uh, another favorite spot in Marin County. If you haven't been there, it's Ring Mountain uh, Open Space Preserve. So this is another one of the contact series. This was done out in Point Reyes <clears throat> National Seashore. The, the thing with the contact series, because the flower is touching the lens, just the slightest movement totally changes the composition, totally changes what's in focus and what's not. So often I'll have to go through a whole lot of tries before I get something that I want to keep. There are a lot of uh, attempts that I just discard because it doesn't work. But but when they work, boy, I'm so happy. They're, you know, in my mind, they're just really beautiful and something really different, showing flowers in a, in a way that most people don't see them. And this is very different for Rob because most of the time he's on a tripod. And this was a way of getting off the tripod and being more spontaneous. So as Rob said earlier, sometimes we'll photograph a flower in sunlight. Sometimes we'll use a diffusion discs and we actually have a lot of different sizes depending on the situation. And this is uh, Ring Mountain again in the, uh, later in the season. And that's why when uh, Juanita said, I carry 65 pounds of gear, that's what a lot of that gear is about. It's about reflectors, diffusers, clamps, pieces of plexiglass, fabric, all sorts of things so that I can, so that we can get the uh, composition in, in the light that best shows off the beauty of the species. So this is the image with diffused light and then again back with the sunlight. So it's a very different feeling to it. The other question we get a lot is, well, how much Photoshop work do you do? Well, uh, the digital cameras capture an image in the in the raw format. It has to be processed through Photoshop to get the actual image converted from the numerical data that the sensor creates to the actual colors of the pixels for the image. So uh, when we photographed this image, it, uh, this scene was photographed under uh, fading sunlight. It was blue sky overhead. The blue sky was putting a cast over everything. That, that's what the camera saw. What we, there was just a little bit of sunlight in the middle of the extreme top of it where you can see some light, light yellow, but everything else was under blue light. So our eyes compensate for blue light in the shade. When you look at someone's skin tone in, in the shadows, you don't see a blue cast. But so what we saw was what this is. And then the camera uh, uh, captures the scene in a very, very low contrast so that all the uh, light values are recorded. So then we go in and we add more, more contrast and whatever else it takes to bring the scene back to what it was we saw and also to create the actual, I mean, the accurate colors uh, for the flowers because the purpose of the book is, is to show the flowers in the way that people would normally see them. We also sometimes need to clean up the background. So we don't cut out the flowers and put a background in them we create a white background or a black background, but sometimes we need to clean up the background um, so that we have a pure white or a pure black. And this was up on Mount Tam again. And this, it gives you an idea of what it looks like in the, um, in the book, in the spread. Again, here's um, a wild buckwheat and it was very windy, very sandy. We took two pieces of fabric, put them down. The, the sand kept coming up uh, onto the fabric. So in Photoshop, we went and cleaned up the background, brought up the saturation and the contrast to what we remembered it as being uh, more accurate. And again, here it is in the book. And as we mentioned before, we're 
often dealing with wind, sometimes rain, and in this case in Utah, <clears throat> we were dealing with bugs. There were no CMs there, and I am putting on whatever I can to keep them out of my ears, out of my nose. It's a clean pair of underwear to try to keep them, um, just keep them out. And poor Rob um, <clears throat> spent more time on the ground and was, had over 200 bites from the no -seums. So it's a lot of work for us to create these images, but we love the flowers and what we get in the end enough to sometimes really suffer through it. <laughs> and we started a project, we had these images and we wanted to do something with them that would um, inspire hope and action. So we created a project called Beauty and the Beast, Wildflowers and Climate Change. And the curator at the Jewett Gallery at the San Francisco Main Library asked us to do an exhibit focused on California wildflowers. So this was an exhibit of 100 images that opened in January of 2016. It's since been reduced to a traveling of exhibit of about 54 images uh, that's been seen by about 45,000 people and a large print version of this exhibit with about 41 images is uh, being installed at the San Diego Museum of Natural History and it should be opening sometime in the winter. Yeah, we're hoping in January. It was supposed to open in November, but we're keeping our fingers crossed we'll, they'll be able to open in January. And some of the images are 12 feet tall. And in the foreground there, you'll see one of our favorite pieces of equipment, and it's our knee pads, which are critical in doing this work. And ergodyne, uh, E R D, wait a minute, erg, E R G O D D Y N E, supplied the uh, about six pair of knee pads because we wear them out. And then, um, uh, who was the company that, that uh, supplied our? Um, I'm drawing a blank right now. Yeah, but I, what right. I wanted to say about these knee pads is they're absolutely wonderful for photo photographing or for gardening. They feel like uh, kneeling in um, stiff jello. And so from the exhibit, we wanted to create a book. We had all these images and we wanted to create a book and expand on the text in the book. So we invited a group of wonderful, passionate um, scientists, environmental leaders, nature writers to write short, um, personal short stories, fictional, uh, non-fictional short stories to educate people and become a voice for wildflowers. Peter Raven. And Peter Raven, many of you may know Peter Raven wrote our foreword and one of our, uh, the essay on um, the origin of California's wonderful plants. And this represented over a dozen organizations that were involved. So it's a very collaborative project. There are three sections to the book. The, uh, the gift of beauty, the human connection, and ensuring the future. And the yes and the short stories in the book re relate to each section. For example, uh, there was a wonderful uh, story called Chasing Spring Time is Everything by Ryan Burnett. He tells the story of the epic migration of the Rufus hummingbird that uh, has its migration from Mexico to its breeding grounds in Alaska. He talks about phenology, the timing of natural events, and how disrupting this timing is affecting the hummingbird, if, if the flowers aren't there blooming at the right time, if they bloom too early because climate change is warming things and melting snow earlier, then uh, the, the, the flowers aren't there when the bird arrives. So uh, the essays are intended to uh, educate people. They're pretty short essays, average about 1,200 words. So what we do is we use the uh, short stories uh, and paste them throughout the book to get to get people reading and looking at the flowers.
And we also talk about pollinators. This was something from the National Wildlife Federation. We have a uh, story on the five California deserts. We actually have five in California, which is some of the best places for, um, for wildflowers. And that was written by Susan Twight. And we'll have more wild uh, desert images in a little bit. Robin Wall Kimmerer, who's a Native American botanist and professor, wrote a story called What's in a Name? And it's this wonderful story about the names, name her grandmother used um, for the wild strawberry, what Linnaeus used um, in the taxonomy, and the history now of DNA um, changing names as well. Wendy Takuda wrote a wonderful story of Zen and the Art of Pulling Broom. And she's a avid broom puller and restoration volunteer over in the East Bay. So many of you may know of her. Um, Talking to Children About Climate Change Without Scaring Them was written by Amber Paris. This was a flower that I photographed in Point Reyes National Seashore. It's called the uh, candy flower. And it's one of the most beautiful flowers I've seen. It's got such wonderful, uh, almost metallic iridescence to it. And then we, we've, we've done uh, stories on seed banking. This is Genevieve Arnold from the Theodore, Pound, Theodore Payne Foundation. We also have a section in the book uh, devoted to uh, fire ecology, what returns after fires have gone through. That previous image is a fire poppy and shows up only after a fire has been through. So we photographed uh, areas in Cleveland National Forest. Uh, um, th this is uh, Bureau of Land Management land in, in, uh, in Lake. County. It's, uh, uh, it's on the uh, Redbud Trail. In Cash Creek area. So we wanted to show people what, what comes back, the beauty that returns after, after fires. Because it's so devastating that all this is happening, um, but there is a bright side that the flowers actually can um, get more sunshine and can be very prolific, especially the bulbs. These are the fairy, golden fairy lanterns, ethereal spear. And they've also been fed by the ash. So if they have the right rains, you can have an amazing bloom afterwards. This field and the field after this were just all, all, all charred. I mean, there, there was nothing there. And this was, came, this was what came back the following year after the rains came. And this is in uh, Edgewood Preserve in Sonoma County. You can see in the upper- Pe uh, Pepperwood. Oh, I'm sorry, Pepperwood Preserve, thank you. Uh, in Sonoma County, you can see where the uh, fire had burned the trees. It, when I looked at the soil beneath these flowers, it was all charred, it was all black. And this is from the Tubbs fire where uh, Santa Rosa had a major burn. and some of the flowers that we also, individual flowers we find in the burn areas. Nita found this, this pair of flowers just as it was. We didn't arrange it or put them together. So sometimes we have these wonderful surprises that, that, that uh, turn up. So again, you know, everything we do is out, out in the field and we uh, always choose either public land or, or uh, land that's been preserved preserved for the public. So the, as I mentioned before, the desert is one of our favorite areas. This is, uh, so we're gonna go through a, a series here. This is Death Valley. Uh, the yellow flowers you saw below uh, all those eroded lake deposits in the previous picture are the same yellow flowers that you see here in the, in the foreground. This was taken after the sun had set under some beautiful warm light in Death Valley. And sometimes it doesn't look like there's much there, but if you walk 
um, a few dozen feet, you can end up finding something like this. And we also found rambling milkweed in that area. This was our first super bloom out in Death Valley. 1998. So once we had experienced that, we were absolutely hooked. This is the rambling milkweed I mentioned, and we always look for any insects that might be on them as well. And that's a crab spider, and we find that they change color depending on where you find different color crab spiders, a bright yellow ones on yellow flowers so that they camouflage well. Uh, another favorite place to photograph is Joshua Tree National Park. So often there's some interesting ground details to do. And the soil is very different from the other, the other parks. It's a coarse granitic soil in the upper reaches of the park. So normally in a desert wash in Joshua Tree, this is what you see, maybe a, you know, a few flowers scattered. This is the, uh, can the desert Canterbury bells. Well, on a really, really good year in 1998, uh, the image on the left, I mean, on the right is what you saw. The, uh, it was an abundant rain and it lasted for a while. So the flowers were growing to maybe two or three times their average height and there was just a, an abundance of flowers. This is desert chicory. The desert dandelion. So the variety is just wonderful. Five spot, which you have to make sure you photograph early enough in the day because they close, start closing at three in the afternoon. And, uh, another favorite place to photograph that many people may know is Anza Borrego Desert State Park in the uh, extreme southern part of the, of the state. It's a different, it's a different desert. It's, uh, it's the Colorado desert, which is a sub desert of the Sonoran desert. And this was a really, really rare uh, fog that we captured. We had been there for 12 days and we had rain in nine of them, which was really unusual. And now due to social media, when there's a super bloom, you've all heard of what happens with the crowds that try to get into the desert. And so our, our final favorite place to photograph is where it all started in the Antelope Valley, California Poppy Reserve. The mountains in the background are the, are the San Gabriel Mountains. And this was taken, these are the same clouds that the uh, early Gorman pictures were taken in. So uh, there are a few images in the book of flowers that were taken out of state. This was taken in Nevada. Uh, these flowers were, uh, like I said, taken, I mean, some were taken out of state, but the species does live in the state. So uh, I felt it was okay to put them in there to show what we, ha what we have. And often there'll be a really interesting background like a rock behind the flower. This is serpentine rock um, and uh, we found this in the Sierra foothills. Another favorite area is um, Table Mountain over in Butte County. On the left is the um, the uh, mountain lady slipper that I talked about that we drove all the way to Quincy for. So we're just going to go through now and, and go through now and show uh, a selection of flowers in the book. And these are the spreads that are in the book, the two page spreads. This was taken on Mount Rainier. Oops, sorry. This again, Ring Mountain, and the Tiburon Mariposa Lily, and the left one along with the soap plant. It's 
So it took us three years to put the book together. Um, 27 years of photography and three years to actually work on the book, which was a lot more work than we anticipated, but we're very, very pleased with the result. The book has two indices, uh, and one is for plant names and the other is for plant locations. And also we wanted to include a glossary because there are terms that are used in, in the short stories that some people may not be aware of. And a lot of people ask us, well, how do you identify plants? Well, for us, we have guidebooks. We also talk to experts um, to help us with that. Um, and now there's a, a relatively new website called plantid.net. And it's probably one of the better sites to go to if you're a beginner. I've been, we've been using Cal Flora for, for years and years. Uh, it's, it's, it's just such a comprehensive website. There are so many different things you can do with it. Uh, and we saw a really good presentation on Cal Flora that was done at the, our, our local chapter. And um, I, I don't know what we do without this. One reason it's so important is because so many people have contributed so many images and so much in information to uh, get an accurate accounting uh, of what the plant is. There's a lot of information there. And Calscape, which is the CNPS site, and one of the emphasis there is to teach you what plants to put into your gardens. So we're always encouraging people to put native plants into their gardens. It's best for the, for the environment, best for the pollinators and the other wildlife in the area. And that's calscape.org. And there's a quote in the book that we really love by David Brower. It says, truth and beauty can still win battles. We need more art, more passion, more wit in defense of the earth. And that's what we had hoped we could do with our book, is to help defend wildflowers and the rest of life on earth. So the book is, inv is available in a regular edition and this limited deluxe edition. The, the content in each version of the book is the same. The difference is the, is the covers. Um, with the deluxe limited edition, there, there's a beautiful linen cover and, and the book comes in a clamshell case. And a tip-in page which is signed and numbered. And with the regular edition, if you take the uh, paper cover off it, there's a nice surprise that you'll see below. It's a California poppy that was taken out at Point Reyes. So this is the cover of the book, the hardcover. So we want to thank you for joining us and uh, on our journey for um, the making of Beauty and the Beast, California wildflowers and climate change. And we invite you to support the work that we're doing um, by buying a book for yourself or as a gift. They make wonderful gifts. We were getting wonderful response from people. So you can find out more about the books on wildflowerbook.com. Um, also help us with social media and spread the word. And, uh, oh, we forgot to mention, we co-published the book with the California Native Plant Society. I think I said that <laughs> oh, earlier. Oh, did you say it? Yeah. Well, just in case. Yeah, we want to so say it again. Thank we, you, we, CNPS. For, for helping us and supporting this project. So now we are open to questions. Let me um, get us out of this. Oops, where's my cursor? There we go. Stop the share. And... Um, Joan, do you have some questions for us? Uh, I think I'm actually going to read this to you. I'm going to be reading the questions. All uh, right. Beautiful presentation. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to seeing the book. Good. 
All right, so I'm going to start from the top from the questions and then you guys just prompt me to go to the next one. Um, the first question is from Norma Wallace and she asks, are all these images included in the book? Yes. Well, most of them. There's probably only about three that aren't. And there are 190 images in the book and 18 short stories by 16 authors. Uh, one of the images that isn't in the book is the... Uh, variations of, of sunlight versus shade uh, on that iris. The other one is the image of the, um, uh, when we showed you what we did in Photoshop with, a, uh, with the flowers in that, uh, in that landscape. Yeah, but most of, them are yeah. In the, most of them are in the book, yes. And a whole lot more that you didn't see. Right. <laughs> And, and this question was, um, it did come up on the screen when you were still showing a little bit of your history. So were those pictures of your history, Anita, some of your work, were, those are not in the book, right? This is focused on the wall. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's just background on the, on the work that we were doing. Okay, so I'm going to move to the next question. Nita, do you find that your history of photographing people influenced the way you approach photographing flowers? That's a good question. I know when we went to Antarctica photographing penguins, it definitely influenced. When Rob and I came back, our images were totally different. Mine were about the penguins and the personality and Rob's were more about the landscape and the environment that the penguins were in. Um, as, but I don't think with flowers so much. I mean, it's... with. With flower, actually, it's interesting. With flowers, I tend to not use a tripod because I didn't with people and I was much more spontaneous. So I'm more resistant and um, spontaneous with photograph, resistant to, to stopping and setting up a tripod. While Rob is used to being on a tripod and continue to, to work that way. So. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> I think it does, actually. It sort of addresses the way you photograph, just the way you approach life in your art. Okay, this next question from Norma Wallace. This contact style of photog, did you invent this? The contact. Uh, yeah, as far as I know, yeah. Uh, the uh, contact series where the flower is touching the lens. Yeah, I figured out a way how to do that, and I haven't seen anybody else do it. And it kind of looks like uh, the, the flowers may have been put on a scanner with a light behind them, but um, I figured a way to get that, that uh, thing out in the field. So as far as I know, no one else is doing that. And it's a lot of work. Yeah, and we never, we never pick a flower. Yeah, and I make sure when I'm doing this that I don't hurt the flower. It's just a very, very gentle very, very gentle contact. And it looks like if I've got a flower with really delicate petals, I won't do it. It's all about, you know, preserving the individual. Um, I spend sometimes, you know, 40 minutes photographing one flower. And so I'm in, you know, intimate emotional contact with that thing. I see the beauty, I see the texture, I see the color. So, for, for me to take something out of the ground and kill it to get a photograph is something I could never do. All right, so we're gonna have another, another question for you that's a bit technical. What are the typical settings? What depth of field do you typically want get? Uh, it depends on the technique I'm using. I use a, an, an old 50 millimeter macro lens made by Canon and I try to get as much in focus, as much depth of field as I can. So um, I'll usually be uh, at about at least F16, maybe even F20. But uh, at F20, I'm losing sharpness. Um, I found with a, a high resolution mirrorless Sony camera, I can get farther back, uh, which means I'll have more in in focus that's that's sharp the flower will be smaller overall but i can crop into it and get greater depth of field as far as shutter speeds go um sometimes in low light after sunset 
Uh, if it's really still, I can be doing two seconds as long as the flower doesn't move in the wind. Uh, I've been photographing as fast as like a 500th of a second. So it just depends on the light and what the wind conditions are. So the- And it's, uh, and it's tough for people who know a little more, it's tough to do focus stacking because of wind. Um, so we need to try to get it in that one exposure. Hope that answers the question. If it doesn't ask, ask, ask me something else again, I'll be okay. happy to answer. Okay, I, I will look for those at the end. I'm gonna keep reading through what we have. Um, this is not a question, but it's actually a little advice to you about getting a commission on the knee pad referral. So that's from Norma. <laughs> Um, yeah, we, we we do need to contact them, get a referral for the knee pads. Yeah, we, we want to see if they'll help promote our book too. All right, do you do your own printing? Well, I think you answered a little bit of that. Do you want to say anything more about your own printing? We, yeah. Uh, me, I'll answer this one. Okay. We have a 44 inch printer in our house. So we are able to print um, pretty large prints for our art consultants and also for the exhibit. And um, so that's that was a learning curve to be able to do that. But that's, yeah, we do do it in-house in if it's on paper. And then we also um, do prints on aluminum, which doesn't have to be framed. It's another option. And the aluminum prints are done by a company out in uh, Walnut Creek, uh, Magnachrome. I mean, that's something we're just not set up to do. Okay. And I, can, can I just add one thing that I, uh, people might be interested in Homer E. House, which I'm about to put on the, he, in, back in the early 1900s, he was photographing wildflowers in the field with a box and a cardboard background. And the box helped him keep the, flower from moving because some of his exposures back then were 20 minutes and he has some books out called one called wildflower and the other a two volume um wildflowers of new york and you can still find the books because mcmillan actually printed another uh edition in 1976 the first books were 1924 and we told peter raven about it and he did some research, he did some asking around to see if we could find out if the uh, glass plates still existed and had a really interesting story that someone um, who worked at the Museum of New York found them in a room filled with things that were about to be thrown out. And he realized what they were and he saved them and categorized them and so now they're talking about maybe doing an exhibit with that work. But it was really interesting to find and to be able to see in this book images similar to ours that were done a hundred year over a hundred years ago. So photographing flowers with backgrounds behind them is something like Nita said that was done a long, long time ago. And a lot of photographers, a lot of photographers have done that really, really well. Yeah, well, that's beautiful in your book. So thank you for carrying on the tradition. Um, let me get to the next question. In your experience, what variables create a super bloom? What combo and timing of rain, heat, other factors? Well, it has to be the right amount of rain uh, at the right time and, uh, and, uh, and not get too hot when the buds are out and when the flowers are out. It depends on the environment uh, of, for example, that beautiful display of wildflowers we found, uh, I, I mean, that, that, that we photographed above the town of Gorman. Uh, we were told that um, although some years there had been a lot of rain, uh, the rain hadn't been coming through at, at the right times and coming through sequentially to create enough uh, germination. And then uh, sometimes the rains came through at the right times in the right sequence, but the, uh, but the temperatures were too high too early and it, and, it, um, and it dried out the buds. So they didn't, so the flowers didn't 
didn't bloom the way they could have. So sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's a combination of a lot of things. But the most important thing is just having a lot of water. Um, now, some of the things we saw in Death Valley in 1998, the flowers had started blooming really early. Uh, in January, we were we, we were down there photographing uh, on my birthday, the first week of January. The rains had had come through early and started the blooms early, and the rains continued way into March. So there were flowers blooming maybe a month or two early, as far as an abundance of flowers, and and it kept going through. So it's really a combination of of uh, of factors. It's the timing, the amount and then the temperatures after the flowers are there. Hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you. Now this is back to the books. Do you offer case discounts on the books? I'm thinking of gifts, says Norma Wallace. Uh, contact us and uh, we, can, we can arrange that. Okay, next question from Norma. Have you seen any areas which burn so hot that flowers did not return? Hoping the answer is no. We haven't seen them, but we've heard about them. Yeah. We've heard about the fact that it can burn so hot that it actually fuses the soil so the, sun, so the rain can't penetrate. And so um, that is one of the uh, negative side effects, if, side effects if, a, if a fire is too hot. Um, but we haven't, we haven't seen that no. oh. ourselves. Okay. All right, looks like you frequently use telephoto lens instead of macro. What determines which is best? I almost never use a telephoto lens. Almost everything I do is a macro, except for landscapes. And, and with landscapes, I'm usually using a, um, usually using a wide angle. But uh, as far as the floral portraits go, almost everything has been done with a 50 millimeter macro. Canon makes a 60 millimeter macro that allows you to get a five power magnification uh, on the image and it's just really really difficult to use but uh, I'll, I'll just I'd say almost every floral portrait um, with the exception of the early film uh, camera I used uh, all the all the digital portraits I've been doing since 2006 have, um, have been made with a Canon 50 millimeter macro. Okay, and then Jake Marr asks, well, he says, first, great presentation and awesome images, thank you. And then he says, how did you get the photo of the hummingbird and flower? He's looking for a story. <laughs> Wait, say that again. Hummingbird I'm sorry. and flower. That is one of our luckiest photos. Oh, I meant to say that. Yeah. Can, I, can I say that? Sure. Uh, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the luckiest photograph I've ever taken of a flower. We were photographing this big, beautiful scarlet fritillary. Nita was holding this big black disc for the black background. Uh, the flower stands about three feet tall. There was a breeze. So I needed to have a fast shutter speed to stop the, to stop the movement. And uh, I was looking through the lens with my finger on the, on the remote camera release when this bird flew in, I got two quick images and the bird was gone. And we waited another 20 minutes for the darn bird to show up and it, and it, and it never came. So it, so that exposure was, lucky because I sort of stopped the movement of the wings but didn't and I liked that that was that shutter speed I have because instead of freezing the wings it just showed that the wings were in motion so it was totally lucky I could not have planned that. Uh, had, I had seen the bird ar around in the area but this was the first time it, we had a hummingbird come in while we were photographing. Nice. All right, from Jim Hansen. Hi, Nina and Rob. Thank you for showing some of the field techniques. Native grasses can be difficult to photograph. Would you try the black background or suggest another technique? Thanks. Yeah, I would, I would try a black background. Um, 
uh, grasses are kind of higher, so sometimes you could probably use the sky as a background, but then you've got the blue color, and I don't know if that would just that would distract, but um, uh, and you could be because the grasses are relatively flat, um, you know, not like the uh, width of a flower, it might be easier just to put the uh, you know, to lean the background up against the grasses and that way you would also help stop the movement. So yeah, I, I think a black background or a white background uh, I'd, I'd, would work. Often in the field, I would try a black background and a white background and I'd try a, a black fabric and a white fabric and then choose which one in the end I liked and sometimes it was a toss up. So a lot of it is, you know, like these, this playful experiment and, you know, having fun with all the options that are out there. Mm, that sounds nice. Okay, so this question, I'm afraid I don't know, it probably related to a moment when you were speaking, but I'll, I'll say it and then you guys can answer to your best. It says, how do we actually create these to be our expectation when we look at our grasslands? Say that again. How do we actually create these? And I'm not sure what he's talking about as these, but how do we actually create these to be our expectation when we look at our grasslands? I don't understand the question. Kent, if you want to hop on and clarify at the end, we'll come back to that question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, from Pamela. Do you teach wildflower photography? No, we don't. Uh, I'm sorry, people have asked me and I, you know, we... But well, we're happy to talk to you yeah, about it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But if you have specific questions or want some feedback, we're happy yeah. to do that. Especially okay. these days where we're not sure when we're going to be out in the field again. Okay, and here's another one for you. How many pictures might you take of each flower to get the great one? Oh, again, that that just depends. Sometimes I've gotten it with the first two exposures, and the composition is is good, and I'm really happy with that. And, and like I said, sometimes Nita will come in and mess up everything and find a better composition. <laughs> <laughs> um, I only I, it's it it just depends on the on the flower. I mean, there are some flowers that I'll uh, I'll take an image of looking at the flower. Uh, some flowers I'll take an image also looking down into the flower, like some of the calicordis species. The mariposa lilies have such interesting, colorful, bizarre uh, um, colors and shapes looking into the flower. So it, de so it depends on the flower. I'm, I'll usually take more than one. Uh, very, you're talking about a variation, yeah, yeah, variation on it. But as far as individual images, um, we try not to take too many because you have to deal with processing them or editing them later. Um, but we, if it's windy, we may have to take more just because we're not sure if it's going to be sharp. And with the cameras that we use these days, you can actually check and make sure that everything is as sharp as you want it to be. Yeah, you can see movement and everything. Um, and if you have the depth of field that you want, your focus is where you want it. Yeah, and sometimes I'll make a composition uh, if, if there is a collection of flowers, like say there's five or six, uh, in, you know, um, a, group. a group of them. Uh, I'll, it's, it, it gets kind of tricky to make sure that each individual blossom is showing as it should be. There's nothing overlapping. Sometimes I won't catch it so I'll, so I'll, so I'll uh, look at what I've got and go back and, and evaluate it. I mean, that's why when we're saying it takes a minimum, of, me a minimum, or us a minimum of 45 minutes, that's a lot of what's going on is, is just kind of tweaking something. I mean, sometimes I'll literally move the, the camera just about half an inch just to get a better composition to make sure that all the elements of that picture are in the you know, where they should be and nothing is overlapping or nothing's hiding something else. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah, that's really fascinating, the amount of labor as well as attention that goes into that. 
All right. Just out of curiosity, could you talk a little bit about your thoughts regarding artists or naturalists who pick flowers for their studies? I'm uh, very opposed to this. Oh, I have such a strong prejudice uh, against that. I, I mean, I talked to one photographer who uses a black background and he pulls them out of the ground and uh, photographs them. And he says, well, it's about showing the species and hopefully um, this image will show people the beauty of it. And, you know, there are so many of these, um, you know, pulling one doesn't make a difference. Well, from my perspective, um, it's like I'm, I'm spending so much time with this one flower and I'm looking at it, like I said before, from a variety of perspectives. I get this emotional connection with this thing, with this, you know, the beauty that's emanating out of this thing and I think about it. And for me to pull this thing out of the ground, to kill it, I mean, it's, it's just something that I could not do. Yeah, we just, we just, we... I, I, I don't think, uh, unless you, you have to do this for, you know, science to preserve the, spe the species or something like that, I just can't do it. I mean, I We just, had an interesting conversation the other day with a new uh, botanical curator at the California Academy of Sciences, and we were talking about the herbarium and the spe specimens and uh, photography versus um, actually pulling the plants and, and the fact that some plants have become rare because they were collected so much. Um, so personally, we, we just can't do it. It's not, it's not in our... It's not in our DNA. <laughs> Well, thanks for sharing your reasoning behind that. I think that gives everyone a little bit more to think about when we're looking at pictures and thinking of our own work. All right, let's go on to Jim Hansen. He gives us a public service announcement. A shout out to everyone who renews their CNPS membership and contributes to conservation efforts to, pre pre protect, bleh, to protect these wonderful places. A way right now to help locally is to join in the Antioch Save Sand Creek campaign, contact Leslie at outreach at ebcnps.org for more info. Thanks, Jim. All right, we're going to go to Lily Chen. Beautiful and inspiring. Did rabbit and bear, stuffed animals in one of the background, enjoy the trip. <laughs> they always come with us. Yeah. They always come with us. And Rob, I, Rob's 50th birthday, I gave him a, a monkey beanie baby named Zorro when we were in Anza Borrego Desert State Park and he became Rob's uh, art critic and spiritual advisor and goes photographing with us and with Rob all the time. So um, thank you for noticing them and they thank you for noticing them. So I have more help than you could possibly imagine. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, William Hudson, he is finding Homer D. House on Amazon. Oh, good. Homer D. Okay, that's what it was, not E. Good. Okay. Paul Preston, this was a wonderful presentation. I'd love to have others who couldn't attend see it. Is there a way to share your presentation? I think I saw a note that it was going on the CNPS, like YouTube. Did I make that up? Yes, you didn't. I mean, no, you did not make it up. You saw it correctly. Um, yes, we have our, I, I will um, say a little more at the end, but we have a brand new chapter um, YouTube channel, which does not have anything on it yet. And this will be our wonderful presentation video uh, to launch our YouTube channel. So it should be up there, mm, give us a few days to a week, but, um, but we will post it there. Okay, cool. Thank you for doing that. All right, William says, Add my vote to how wonderful these images are. Thanks. And then he says, have you gone into areas specifically recovering from one of our wildfires? Well, the Lake County was the last time we, uh, we made a couple of trips up to Lake County. And there's going to be a lot of land this year, obviously, if the rains come in, that may be covered with wildflowers. So yeah, we'll uh, have to, have to keep our eyes out. Yeah, um, uh, we went to Pepperwood Preserve intentionally because we had heard that there was a good wildfire recovery there. Uh, when we were down in the uh, Santa Ana Mountains in Orange County, we specifically sought 
uh, out areas that that had burned. So yeah, I mean that's the, the when we find places that have burned that have recovered. Uh, I mean that's definitely on our list to go photograph because we want to show people what comes up. Yeah, so that's been uh, uh, really intensive uh, and uh, um, and important part to show in the book. I wish we could have put more images in the book to show that, but we only had so much space. Okay, and then we'll go to another from William. Did anyone ID the hummingbird for you? Yes, it's a Rufus hummingbird. It's a Rufus sighted? No, no not Rufus sighted. Oh, yeah. It's a Rufus hummingbird. Yes, we, we, that's what we thought it was and we, had, we confirmed it. Okay. So we had a lot of help from people like uh, Bruce Baldwin um, at UC Berkeley and uh, Kristen Jacobs of Marin Chapter are some of the people who helped us um, confirm the IDs or even ID some of the flowers. We're not experts at knowing uh, which flower it is. D Doreen Smith. Doreen Smith uh, from our local chapter, and then Ted Ted Kipping, who was a great friend of ours that recently passed away, was an uh, amazing amateur botanist. He helped us, and so I, I mean we couldn't have done this without the help of a lot of people. Not only people who helped us ID ID the plants afterward, but uh, ch chapter members up and down the state that we would call and say, "Oh, well, you know." you really got to see this flower, you, you know, you really have to go here. And, you know, so we really relied heavily on California Native Plant Society to get this book out in a, in a lot of different ways. Yeah, a lot of different ways, right? All the way to the publishing. So um, Norma says, thank you. I applaud your ethics and I say thank you. And I am going to pass the mic over to Joan and she's going to let you know if any questions ended up in the chat section. I, I can see one in chat right now, actually. Uh, there's two questions in the chat section. The first question is from Lauren and she says, are most of these taken in springtime? We have flowers that were taken, we've photographed flowers 12 months of the year in California. Most of them are taken in the spring, um, some of them in the, in the summer, at, all the way through to the fall. Um, we definitely avoid the desert when it gets hot because I hate the heat. Well, so do I. Yeah, <laughs> but even more so. And so, um, I, we have never gone back for the monsoon season in the desert because it's just too too hot. And I've wanted to, but uh, maybe maybe some year we will. Well, the second question is from Josh, and he says, Josh Sonnenfield says, can you recap the impacts you are seeing on wildflowers from climate change and what actions you think the public should take to support native plant resilience? Well, what we've been seeing, what we've been hearing, it's more about what the science is, is telling us, is that um, one of the things they're really concerned about is the alpine wildflowers running out of cooler temperature and not being able to move up the mountain um, to stay in the same type of, of climate uh, because there's no soil or there isn't the right conditions for them. So the alpine uh, plants are, are very vulnerable to the climate change. In the desert, um, we're finding more invasives are taking hold because of these um, swings in the, in the uh, rains so that there are wetter years so you can get more of the invasive plants. And that's one of the reasons why Joshua trees um, were uh, burning so badly this last uh, month was because of the native, the non-native grasses that had gotten established in that area. Um, what people can do, we have one of the um, stories is what you can do to make a difference and there are 25 different things you can do to make a difference both uh, connected to climate change to um, conservation as well as sustainability. And um, the number one thing right now 
is to vote and to help get the vote out because um, our current president is very anti climate change and um, is doing a lot to make things even worse. And he's also um, very um, anti conservation. So voting is probably the number one thing you can do to make a difference. And then also look at your carbon footprint and see what you can do to um, decrease the amount of carbon your lifestyle is, uh, is producing. But important you. question, thank you. That's okay, it. well, well, you know, I'm seeing there are two new Q&A questions here. Um, oh, well, we're do you, still do here. you guys have energy for two more? Oh, yeah. absolutely. Does well, the we've, never had, have... we've never had so many, but we love it. Yeah, oh, I mean, that's great. Yeah, we, we love all the attention. Thank you. <laughs> well, we all love you. I can tell you that. Um, very, very wonderful. Um, so the first question, um, which you could probably spend a few days on, was um, have you spent any time testing the soils of some of the areas you photographed to uh, uh, some of the areas you photographed to determine what factors may assist super blooms or certain rare species. Somebody could spend a day on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's we're not, not scientists. Our field. No, we depend on scientists to tell us all that interesting stuff. Yeah. But yeah. we noticed what happens, for example, with serpentine. You know, certain soils, there are definitely um, plants that are specific to that area because serpentine is so toxic to most plants. And so it's fun when you when you find uh, a really wonderful bloom in serpentine, for example. And the the last question is from um, Janae Harvey. I am so very appreciative of all you do. Thank you. What is one of the biggest changes you have seen because of climate change? Well, again, we're seeing more super blooms more frequently, um, like we said before, you know, these used to be 100 year blooms uh, because the, all the conditions that came together, you know, historically didn't come more frequently on average than 100 year. And uh, since 1988, we've seen about well, one, two, three, four, five, maybe, yeah. maybe six. And so, uh, yeah, w with all the, you know, drought and deluge thing that's what we're seeing uh i mean we're really happy to see the super blooms come so frequently but um but on the flip side we're seeing the for example the, the stress on the forests and other plants which are causing these horrific fires and so um it's it's causing a lot of destruction on the other hand. So one hand, you're getting these wonderful super blooms. On the other hand, you're getting drought that's really uh, decimating ecosystems. And the Rufus Hummingbird, they, um, as Rob mentioned in that essay, uh, Ryan is actually studying the, the hummingbird in the mountain meadows in the Sierras. And years when it's really dry, he's finding that there are very few birds, in which means that they may not be making it through their migration because the plants aren't blooming at the time that they need them for their fuel. As Rob mentioned, the phenology, the timing gets thrown off. There was a really interesting study done by Dr. John Hart out of UC Berkeley. He and his wife have been working at the, uh, at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. I think that's what that is in Crested Butte. Colorado, uh, what uh, th uh, studying alpine, subalpine, I think subalpine environments, what he did decades ago was set up these heaters over, con over plots uh, of, 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 of soil. Uh, he had control plots where there were no heaters over them and plots where there were, he was adding, I think two degrees uh, consistently uh, over the whole year and uh, he's collected data on what's been happening so he could predict what's going to, uh, what he can anticipate in these environments and uh, 
what he's shown is that when you uh, add heat, the, the, the snow naturally um, melts sooner, so the flowers bloom earlier. Sometimes when the flowers bloom early, they are still in the frost season, so the flowers' buds can get frosted and die. So the flowers don't bloom even though the uh, plants have grown. Also what's happening with uh, lower rainfall, these beautiful uh, wet wildflower meadows are drying out and it's allowing the uh, shrubs and trees to invade. This is happening uh, all over the, sub, the subalpine areas. So what's happening is these uh, wildflower meadows are being uh, overtaken by shrubs and trees from uh, fr from lower down. So these these meadows are going to be lost, some of them anyway, at some point. And that's really really sad when you, because I mean we've photographed some of these most amazing wildflower meadows, in the San Juan Mountains in in Colorado, and uh, you know. To, to imagine this great diversity of multicolored flowers, you know, for hundreds and hundreds of the square yards gone because there's these, you know, wonderful shrubs and trees coming in. I mean, there's a lot to be lost and that's all being attributed to uh, climate change and, you know, global warming. Well, thank you very much.